Rules. Without them, we'd live with the animals. John Wick. Why do you behave like an animal? Animals do whatever they want. They don't give a fuck. Shit on the street? No problem, sir. Here's a big shit for you to pick up. Rip off the couch because it smelled weird? Well, now you gotta buy a new one. Bite you? You need a few stitches? Well, he was just nervous that day. That's what animals do, but we still don't blame them for it, do we? When a cat rips open your skin, you don't scream at it and throw it 20 feet in the air as a punishment. Why? The cat physically attacked you. Oh yes, because it doesn't have consciousness. Or at least your amount of consciousness. Different species of animals do have abilities like compassion and communication, but a dolphin can't discuss the communist manifesto with you, and if he did, he would probably sexually assault you midway through. Yeah, back to the main point. Animals do what their instincts tell them to do, what they feel like doing at the moment. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why do you live like an animal? Why do you let your emotions get the best of you? Why do you cuss at somebody anytime you feel angry? Why do you pick up sweets anytime you crave sugar? Why do you burden others because of your incompetency to deal with yourself? Seneca says that a man is a reasoning animal. Evolution and God gave you your cognitive power and the ability to reason different situations that you end up in life. Use those abilities. Today we're gonna talk about why it's not your fault that emotions guide you and how society doesn't want you to use reason and logic when making decisions and how you can battle that with the use of philosophy and psychology. So let's dive in. First up, why do emotions get the best of most people? Simple human nature. Human nature is deterministic in some sense. You can't change it by snapping your fingers. I mean, you can make subtle changes, but changing the whole society is going to be a long, long process. I'll explain. We as human beings have lived like cavemen for far longer than we have organized societies. And only for the last 100 years or so do we have a functioning, technologically advanced civilization. Can you comprehend that just 100 years ago, the single biggest worry of our ancestors was if they're going to eat that day or not. And today, we discuss if it's going to be pizza or burgers and at what restaurant. The percentage of undernourished people in the world as of 2022 is at 9.4%. And that's a 3.5% decrease in comparison to the 2000s. So about 287 million people. We came a long way. But think about how our brain had thousands and thousands of years more to optimize for the life of the primitive man, the man who hunted mammoths and ran from lions, than for a life of a college computer science student. So we're stuck with this ancestral brain of ours that largely uses emotions and instincts to make decisions. Decision making seems to ironically be the deciding factor of a great life. If you constantly make good decisions, it's only a matter of time when you're going to get really wealthy and happy. Happy. Of course, not everybody is good at making decisions all the time, nobody's perfect, and making good financial, health, and relationship decisions isn't easy at all. But for the ease of explaining them, they can be separated into two groups. The first is decisions which are hard to make, and the second is decisions which are hard to execute. The first type are things like your life's purpose and meaning, the career you want to pursue, and the person you want to procreate and spend the rest of your life with. Stuff like that. The second type are easy, obvious decisions that you know would be beneficial for you, but they are hard to execute. One example would be losing weight. It's an obvious decision that you need to make, but the act in and of itself, the work you have to put in to lose the weight, is the hard part. So we can safely say that decision making is a skill, and a skill you need to master in order to have a great life. But the gist of it is austere, strict analysis coupled with self-questioning. Asking yourself a bunch of questions and finding loopholes that you couldn't have seen without them. We'll talk about how to make good decisions later, but what's even more important is realizing where people fall short of having good judgment. This is seen in something called heuristics, which is the most used method for decision making. It's like if you were to walk right into a narrow, dark alley and you see your person right in front of you put their hood on and your brain is like telling you get me the fuck out of here because you watch too many serial killer netflix tv shows so it's a quick and easy way to make good enough decisions for most of the time look at it as a mental shortcut it uses things like experiences gut feeling and instinct to choose on the fly and don't get me wrong i love heuristics they're awesome but where heuristics fall short is making complex logical decisions things like who are we supposed to do business with or what path should i take in my life and it leaves us open to these biases like the confirmation 
and the negativity bias, where people tend to make decisions based on their feelings and experience rather than logic and data. You can see this in people who start businesses with their friends just because they can't say no and then later that friendship breaks apart because one guy works harder than the other and actually has skills and the other guy just did it because it's a cool idea. Trust me, I had one of those. The second example would be people who say that we have worse political freedom and higher racism. While well, that's factually not true and they're only seeing something on TV and making decisions off of what they saw on social media. And I'm not saying that there isn't some nasty shit happening out there. I'm saying that it's better than it used to be and that it's getting better. And the only reason why I even talk about this is that I get so frustrated when I see people close to me like my mother being fear mongered by the media and as a byproduct of that fear mongering others because this is happening and that is happening not realizing that she's being psyoped by her inability to process informations and make clear judgments. And the exact next thing that we'll talk about is the question of who is controlling your emotions. And that is another side of the coin and it's who provides you, who stirs up your pot, who rattles your cage, who makes you cuss out the TV or burst into tears. And it's obvious, it's the politicians, athletes, celebrities, influencers. I'm not a huge conspiracy guy, and that's the exact thing a huge conspiracy guy would say, but do you really think that all of these controversies surrounding those people are not well planned and calculated so that they achieve the exact effect of emotional instability and vulnerability in the ones who watch? So they're calculated decisions end up being your emotional actions. They want you to sit, pay attention, buy, watch, vote, and you have to understand that that's not bad in and of itself. Everybody persuades, but it is bad when you have to compensate doing meaningful things because you're talking about what the new Kardashian is wearing and you're not doing things like working on a new business, spending time with family, learning, traveling, doing things that have a better return on investment for yourself and eventually society. So if you're not using your lazy part of the brain and the heuristics we talked about and you reason what's actually important, you will limit your exposure to things that rile you up and make you more prone to making shit decisions. Next thing that's worth mentioning is the rising narrative that you have to show more emotion, that you have to express your emotions. And I'm talking especially about men. You're pressured into being vulnerable and expressing your feelings and voicing your emotions just because a certain group in society wants everybody to be softballs. And I'm not retarded. I do realize that there are some huge benefits in learning how to tell other people about your emotions. But after some time, I do find most of that thing really obnoxious and annoying. Yeah, we do have some moments where we are mentally challenged and ready to talk about it, but I don't want to be forced into it. And take what I'm about to say and what I'm saying as a purely subjective matter. It's how I reason and I'm saying it because some part of you might resonate with it. Hear me out. Sometimes you just don't want to talk about what's happening inside. You find silence and peace comforting. You don't need any assistance. And Marcus Aurelius says, withdraw into yourself. It's in the nature of the rational directing mind to be self-content with acting rightly and the calm it thereby enjoys. The rational mind withdraws itself to focus on a problem until it eventually solves it. And my experience with emotional expression is that whenever I unload myself on somebody, I feel way worse. I feel like a burden because I'm rarely the person in the need of help. I'm the person who helps. I'm the rock for others. I am the shoulder to cry on, the protector and provider, the problem solver. So why do they teach us that emotions matter so much when reasoning is what actually gets things done? The narrative that they're pushing is that by expressing your emotions, you will solve problems that burden you. And that's blatantly wrong. You're not going to get better health or earn for your loved ones by crying or being vulnerable. You're going to do it with good decisions and well-planned action. The second you step into the world is the moment you realize that the utopia of a compassionate and loving world is a facade. We're not there yet. We're gonna be there, I think we're gonna be there, but we're not there yet. The world doesn't care about your problems and doesn't make decisions for you. And I'm not going to pretend to be the beacon of knowledge and tell you how to make decisions. While I do know quite a bit about decision making and I made some good decisions in my life, I'm going to be smart and tell you advice from people far more successful and better than me and you and just serve it to you in a more organized fashion. Decision making is all about rules and questions. Rules are there to keep your emotions in check and restrain you from making huge mistakes and questions are there to prompt your mind and force you to think beyond 
profit and instant gratification. I prepared seven rules plus seven questions that I'll read out here and then hopefully you can use them to make better decisions. Plus at the end of the video, I have something for you and don't worry, it's totally free. These are the rules to keep in mind before making any important decision. Peace. When you make decisions, be in a place of peace, both physically and mentally. Pressure and greed. If you feel pressured to make a decision, sleep over it and then make it on your own terms. If you feel greed setting in, don't do it. Opinions. If you want to make the wrong decision, ask everyone. Certainty. If you can't decide, the answer is no. Monkey mind. Turn off the monkey mind, leave judgments and how you think the world should be out of the process. Leverage. If the downside is zero and the upside is infinite, take the risk. Experience. Talk to someone who has what you want and ask them for guidance. Next up, the questions. Critical thinking. Does this make sense to me? Clarity. Is this bringing me a clear direction of what the next step is? Heart feeling. Is this who I am in my heart? Long term. Is this going to cause short term pain and long term gain or vice versa? Personality. Do I want to be the sort of person who does X? Energy. Will this energize me or drain me? Uno reverse. Is this decision reversible or cancelable? These were the rules and the questions. I know you might be a little confused right now because I didn't go into depth on every single one of them and explain them. But if I did, the video would be like an hour long. But what I did do is that I made a free Notion document that you can use as a checklist. And in that document, I go into depth on every single one of the rules and questions and go over things like the context, why they are important and how to use them all of it. And yes, you can go without it and just go through the video again and take notes. But I just think you would be missing out on a lot. And that's why I made it completely free. So you can just go to my description, click the link and download it. That's the video. If you're interested in joining my free community called the creator philosophy, it's for people who want to create meaningful content and connect with other creators so that all of us get better at our craft and grow. You can click the link in the description and join the waitlist on my website. We let people apply for the community only once a month on every September 22nd. So for only 24 hours and when you join the waitlist you will get reminders a few days before we open so that you don't miss out and as I said commu the community is completely free but I'm very strict in who I let in so if that sounds up your alley just click the link in the description and you can join the waitlist and then later apply. And I'll finish with a quote from Aristotle. The real difference between humans and animals is that humans have the perception of good and evil, just and unjust. It's the sharing of common views in these matters that makes a household and a state. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you around. Bye.